The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. There aren't very many people that walk across this state with their belongings on their back. This is my way of learning what Texas is like. Non-game wildlife are those species of animals that aren't the traditional game species like deer and turkey. This erosion is pretty substantial. We're looking at about 15, 20 feet. It shouldn't be like that. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. A lot of people stop when they see me on the road. Why are you walking? And they offer me a ride, and I have to turn them down. One guy says, you mean you're doing this on purpose? It's not a race, it's not a program, it's, it's more like a lifestyle. This is, this is just what I want to be doing. Dave Roberts is out for a walk. He has been for months. So I'm a little more than three months since I left New Orleans. Dave is walking to New Mexico, taking in miles of Texas along the way. That looks like a watermelon from here. Palmetto is my 26th state park. I've gone about 2,200 miles since New Orleans. So I'm more than halfway through the state of Texas. One guy says, well, you know, there's a bus. You can just take a bus to El Paso. So he didn't get it. I think I'd rather walk. I don't want to just sit home and play card games on the computer and raid the refrigerator every 10 minutes and get fat and lazy. I want to be outdoors. I want to breathe unfiltered air. I want this, the weather to affect me. I want to meet people I've never met. I want to go places I've never been. And that's the lifestyle that I've chosen for myself. Since I left New Orleans, I've used up five pairs of shoes and I'm ready for my sixth. So I'll, I'll get a pair in one of these towns. Okay, this is the kind I normally get right here, but they don't have my size. They look like they'll work. 10 bucks. <laughs> I'm buying $10 <laughs> shoes. Okay, now I need to get a new pair of insoles. They last about 400 miles per pair. They were getting a little thin on the bottom. I just didn't want to feel the road under my feet, and so I bought a new pair of shoes. <laughs> Thank you. They're comfortable, they work, and I'm happy as a clam. Using up shoes traversing Texas on foot may sound extreme, but this is just one in a series of outdoor adventures for Dave. I'm weaving across America. I didn't start out with that in mind. It just happened one step at a time. And it all started. I hiked the Appalachian Trail. I was just going to hike the trail and go home. But it was such an awesome experience, I didn't want it to stop. And when I got to Maine, I rode my bicycle to Florida, and then I hiked the Florida Trail. And so I find I'm zigzagging across the country. Somewhere in Florida, I got the idea that I think I'll paddle down the Mississippi River. So how do I get to Minnesota? I'll ride my bike. Hiking, biking, and paddling. This summer, I paddled down the Mississippi River. So I had to get from New Orleans to New Mexico. So how do you, how do you get there? Well, you, you walk across Texas. And so that's what I'm doing. 
I'm visiting state parks. And right now I'm in Lockhart, Texas, and uh, this is my 27th one, I think. I told some of my friends, oh, I'm gonna walk across Texas, and they said, why Texas? You know, like, like te they think Texas is just desert. And I said, well, I looked at the website, and it looks to me like there's a lot more than just desert out there. Your campsite, there's more trails. That Visiting go up. state parks has made my trip much more interesting. You're all set. Okay, well, thank you very I've much. I've met some of the most warm hearted people I've ever met in Louisiana and Texas. Okay, I made a spreadsheet at 15 miles a day. How many state parks can I do? And it came out to 23 state parks. When I got to Tyler, I was like a week and a half ahead of schedule. I was doing 23 miles a day, not 15. So far, I've done uh, Village Creek, Martin Dyes, Mission Tejas, Martin Creek, Tyler, Dangerfield, Bob Sandlin, Cooper, Bonham, Eisenhower, Ray Roberts, Richardson, Possum Kingdom, Mineral Wells, Dinosaur Valley, <laughs> Cleburne, Whitney, Meridian, Mother Neff, Colorado, Bend, um, Inks Lake, Enchanted Rock, McKinney Falls, Bass Drop, Fisher, Palmetto, and Lockhart. And I have um, 13 to go, something like that. my tent, this is my sleeping pad, this is my food, that's the heavy one, this is my sleeping bag, and this is my dry clothing, and that's it. This is the fourth tent I've had in two years. One was lost, one was stolen, one was melted in a dryer, and now I have this one. My budget is $20 a day. For a lot of people, getting by isn't really enough. The attitude is more important than the gear. I put all my stuff in it, and then I'm ready to have lunch and take a walk. I don't have a knife, so I cut my cheese like this. And I put on my salsa. I was having three of these for lunch a day and realized I was still hungry, and so now I have four. <laughs> I have a saying, if everything goes according to plan, you're not having an adventure yet. <laughs> it's really blowing. Two months and one pair of shoes later, Dave is in far west Texas. This is uh, quite a headwind we got here today. He's back on the road after a medical timeout. I had a pain in my chest, went to the doctor, and he suggested I go for further checkups. So I went home to do that. The diagnosis, heartburn. There's nothing wrong with me uh, physically. I'm in good shape, but I needed to change my diet, and I'm glad I did that. Dave picked up where he left off in Del Rio. After days crossing desert, he is outside Fort Davis. Now I feel assured if I'm out in the middle of nowhere, a thousand miles from the nearest hospital, that I'm okay. And I feel confident to just go and do it at my age. I'm 72. Well, my biggest concern going from here to El Paso is getting enough water. After the pecan orchards, there's really not much water. To Van, to Van Horn. Where towns are scarce. I soak them in water. Dave eats dehydrated meals his daughter mails, and what food he can find to fit his budget and backpack. Two boxes of cereal. That's three days. These are going to be my dinners. Sandwich bags. My pack weighs 13 pounds plus food and water. Four days worth of food. That's 10 pounds right there. This is heavy too, but you gotta eat. <laughs> it's gonna be twenty-eight ninety-two. That's not bad. There you go. Wish you good luck. Thanks a lot. Here I go. Ooh, this is heavy now. Not surprisingly, Dave skips convenience for primitive camping. In a way, I'm out here to escape the hubbub 
and the busyness of the modern world. I can live in that world, but I prefer this. It's absolutely beautiful. You can just see forever up here. It took me an hour and a half to get up here, but it was worth it. 20 or 25 years ago, I had a dream. In my dream, I died and I went to heaven. St. Peter uh, looks at me and he looks down at his book and he looks at me again and he says, uh, why didn't you take advantage of what they had to offer down there? End of dream. And so I woke up and I said, wow, that's pretty powerful. So not long after that, um, I quit my job and I decided that I was going to uh, spend the rest of my life volunteering. So I joined the Peace Corps. A mountaintop seems like the perfect place to contemplate the next adventure. My next adventure is to uh, hike the Continental Divide Trail, which goes from Mexico to Canada. The Triple Crown is the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail. I've already done the AT, plan it to do the CDT this summer. And if I can do the Pacific Crest Trail, then that's the Triple Crown. Nobody that I know has ever done the Triple Crown entirely after the age of 70. So that'll be my claim to fame for what it's worth. <laughs>
task at all. He never lets us down. He always comes through. He works late, gets these done, and uh, he's just been a great team player from the beginning. Partnership is, I, I think, an underappreciated component of the workplace. <laughs> I'd say one of the highlights of my career occurred in 2007 when the commission promulgated uh, the first regulations in Texas that placed limits on the commercial collection of non-game wildlife. Non-game wildlife are those species of animals that aren't the traditional game species like deer and turkey and they compromise about 95 percent of all the wildlife species in the state. And prior to 2007 there were absolutely no limitations on how much of these things you could remove from the wild. So after a pretty long tough battle uh, we were able to get those regulations in place and I'm proud of it. It's important to work at a place where what you do for a living is consistent with your personal values. I am a conservationist, I'm a landowner, I enjoy hunting and fishing. Really, really great to work someplace where I'm helping to keep those things in good shape for present and future generations. It's an island by many names. Bird Island by locals. Sundown Island by some. This is in the top three of biggest, bestest of the rookeries in Texas. I always like birds. It's fun to come out here, see what's going on. But to those who ever met Chester Smith, who dedicated his life to watching over these birds, this is Chester Island. This island used to be 100 acres. Uh, right now it's sitting at 65. And we're losing, depending on which side of the island, we lose as much as 30 feet uh, during a year uh, because of storms, because of ship wake. And you can actually see a ship coming now. Over the last several years, Sundown Island continues to erode away. And that's bad news for these birds, the birds that use this island every year to nest. Sundown came to be in 1962. While building the Matagorda ship channel, all the extra sand and sediment called dredge spoil was molded into this island. it turned into one of the best rookeries or bird nurseries along the Texas coast. For miles around, miles and miles around, this is the only game in town. All those birds that feed and live in that area come to this one island, and that's their nursery, that's their home, that's where they're making babies and, and raising families. That's a pelican nest with only two eggs. For 25 years, Chester Smith worked for the National Audubon Society as a watcher of sorts, a caretaker for the birds. I have a lot of birds that are beautiful when they're in their mating colors. So one of my favorite is Reddy Secret. Reddy Secret is on the threatened list. Chester passed away back in 2011 and left behind a thriving rookery island. But it's now in need of some attention. Yeah, we like to come out and make sure, kind of keep an eye on the erosion throughout the year. We know we don't like to be out here during nesting season, so we keep that to a minimum. This erosion is pretty substantial. We're looking at about 15, 20 feet, you know, a cliff of about 15, 20 feet. And just above that, you've got birds nesting. Uh, so next year, this area may not be here anymore to provide nesting habitat for those birds. It shouldn't be like that. Sundown Island hosts 18 species of colonial water birds. That's everything from brown pelicans to laughing gulls. But more importantly, species of conservation concern like black skimmer, reddish egret. It's got white ibis. 
It's impressive, the diversity on this island. And that's why it's important for us to also create diverse habitat on this island where we can. You can see that in this area, there's still some bare ground spots, which end up being great habitat for terns. Once it starts to get like these sunflowers on the perimeter, it's too vegetated for those birds to use. They like bare ground, ideally. That only happens when we get dredge spoil. And who helps make sure Sundown gets that much needed sand? It's still in the family. Chester's daughter, Peggy, and her husband, Tim, now keep an eye on Sundown. Chester's footprints uh, are, are pretty big, and it's really special to be able to come out and walk the same trails that, that he walked for 25 years. Here's some beautiful great egret chick. You can tell they're great egrets because they have a yellow beak and have green eye shadow. I tell Peggy that uh, you know you walk around the corner and you could just imagine still Chester coming around and meeting you there and, and getting you to work on a project. This latest project, a massive dredge, is pumping tons and tons of sand out to sundown. About 16,000 feet altogether discharge line from here to Sundown Island. This is a win-win. The dredge is here to maintain and deepen the ship channel while Sundown gets the sand. The cutter's down on the bottom. We're digging the material. We're getting about 20,000 gallons a minute. We pump water and sand mixed together. This material is looking really, really good. Even with it being as wet as it is, you can walk right out and stand on it, which is an indication of just fantastic dredge material. Andrew Smith from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been helping to replenish Sundown's shores for decades. Come on, Tester, let's look at this pipe. We've been able to use maintenance material to come out and again start to, to re-nourish Sundown Island. Uh, and, and this particular job is one where we're going to put more material on sundown than we have in the last 10 years at least. Everything looks great. It's real easy to imagine here in a month or two uh, a lot of terns and other you know, ground nesting birds looking at all this and thinking that it looks really good. We had a stack and we're building quite a bit of island. The material is very firm even all the way to the water line so you know, I think it looks fantastic. And in a way, it seems like Chester's still here. That is stacking up like I like it. Probably the bigger reason why we're standing out in this part of the bay and, and on this island is absolutely because of Chester and his dedication to the island. There's no doubt that we want to do as much as we can to preserve and protect this and enhance this. Look at the blooms on that great eagle. Isn't that beautiful? Those two there, look at that. And as for the birds that rely on sundown, it looks like Chester's vision is alive and well. I feel like his spirit's still here in a way. That's Clune Bill on his nest now. So it is a special place to us beyond just the birds. It's, it's all that time that Chester invested to make this a uh, special place. It warms my heart to see this kind of work because it's, it's very easy to imagine him looking down on us and thinking, y'all are doing great. You're doing a great job. It's, it's a beautiful thing. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional support provided by Ram Trucks, built to serve.